Well, a champion for human rights, social justice and a crusader for peace, this is also the legacy of the late Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu. Uh, joining us now to discuss this in more depth, we are joined by the former public protector and current chair in social justice research at the University of Stellenbosch, Professor Tony Madonsela, who of course also delivered the fifth Desmond Tutu Peace Lecture back in 2015. Prof Tuli, good evening. Thank you for uh, joining us and thank you for perhaps uh, making time to reflect on the life of times of the late Archbishop. Good evening, Lizan, and good evening to the viewers. Thank you for the privilege. Prof, in your address this year, I mean, in your lecture, I mean, you spoke about the importance of social justice at large um, in the pursuit of peace. And uh, we obviously know that the late Archbishop, uh, you know, championed this cause fully, embodied it fully as well. Are we any closer to the ideals um, that he so, so vocally stood for? We're not closer to the ideal that Archbishop Desmond Tutu stood for, but we have to be honest that today is better than yesterday. Mm -hmm. If you look at where South Africa was, um, a couple of centuries ago, and even where it was 27 years ago, you will agree with me that the fact that me and you can have this conversation is progress. Mm -hmm. The fact that nobody can be discriminated directly is progress. And we do know that what he fought for, though, was the equal valuing of the worth of every human being the respect for everyone, the, an end to poverty and an end to the apartheid legacy. And therefore, we're not fully there yet. Mm. Okay, Prof, so we look at the progress that has been made, as you've alluded to. Um, we also perhaps look at the role of religious leaders in South Africa to date and, and all those who perhaps occupy you know, off high offices as well. I mean, why did his support you know, matter so much um, as a religious leader, given the socio-political dynamics we find ourselves as a country in to date? His support is important because the religious community influences the values of a society immensely. That's why even colonialism leveraged religion to a certain extent to accept the hierarchization of, of humanity. And I do believe that the role that was played by the church in South Africa, the religious community, particularly under the South African Council of Churches and the Catholic Bishops Conference, is immense and immeasurable. I would like to see the church and the broader religious community take the baton and be a lot more vocal on social justice. I think all of them are vocal on corruption. But I honestly do think that we're not going to make progress on corruption if we're not prepared to make progress on social justice. Mm. In the same breath as we've seen throughout the week, I mean, there have been some contending views on social media about his legacy as well. I mean, do you think these are fair? Do you think, considering his contribution to the fight for equality at large, these warrant any merits at this time? I think so. Uh, people don't go to the same side like water. At least that's what we say in, in Isizul. There are things he said that other people don't like. For example, you had a clip earlier about the gay community. And during the, the last lecture that I gave, the last peace lecture that I gave in his honor, I mentioned that he said that if you went to heaven, and he found that um, it was a, a place that was bigoted against gay and lesbian people, he would ask to be sent to the other place. Mm -hmm. And of course, that would have annoyed uh, right-wing Christians or fundamental Christians. And of course, the issue of Israel. He stood very firm that whilst it's important for Israel to have its security concerns addressed, but what it's doing to the Palestinians is just unconscionable and it's improper for any of us to be quiet about it. And so the, the, there are matters that he was held um, 
well, he was uh, disagreed with on. And then there's the one about Mamwini, who I valued and I cherish to this date, where he asked her to apologize. And Mamwini thought this was wrong. I think he was right, but I understand where she came from. Because if somebody dies at your house, even if you personally had nothing to do with it, it's fair that she should apologize. But I understand Mam Winnie's approach that she felt that being made to apologize may be tantamount to accepting accountability for what happened. Mm. Well, as we, you know, look at both sides of the coin and, and perhaps also indicators of growth, indicators of oppression, uh, we've obviously seen that, uh, you know, sexual orientation oppression perhaps is multifaceted and uh, you know there have been attacks on multiple levels, levels given our history so in view of that I mean how do we begin to embody the lessons that he so you know vocalized and that he lived on how do we carry on um, the the baton that has been handed over perhaps in the liberation of all I really like the way you you put it because it's really about recognizing the humanity of everyone mm. that's why social justice is a better quest because it's an umbrella quest for recognizing the humanity of everyone, restituting those who have been wronged, including everyone's voice in how society is governed. And when it comes to issues of gay, lesbian, and um, the queer community, uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu's voice or message to us is, we must leave judgment to God, ours, is to love every human being. Ours is to embrace the humanity of everyone. And that's Ubuntu. My beliefs are no better than yours. As long as I don't harm you. And if you think about the issue of the gay and lesbian community, honestly, they harm no one. It's a personal choice or it's a biological choice. It must be left as is. And so how do we take the baton? Embrace the notion of Ubuntu at the center of which is justice and fairness to all. Mm. But, and, and I mean, on the back of that, also looking at uh, the, the, the tools we have at our disposal, perhaps the narratives and the perceptions surrounding um, the meanings that we've given to, to uh, you know, what uh, certain things mean contextually and perhaps how we can reframe that um, as we continue the plight of, uh, of the poor, um, as we continue the fight, the, the fight for equality and equity at large. But I wonder, Prof, on a, on a more personal note, I mean, you obviously had the privilege of, of journeying alongside him, knowing him as well. I mean, what, what are some of your personal reflections um, about the late Archbishop in terms of his legacy? When last did you speak to him? Uh, what's been a, one of your fondest memories to date? Well, um, I last spoke to him about a year ago when I visited him and, and Mamlia is at, at their home. And, and his quintessential star, he was there uh, joyfully, despite the fact that his health was already failing. And he made a point of accompanying me and my colleague Diane Guy, who's right up to the gate, and that was quintessential style, Bishop uh, um, uh, Desmond Tutu. My first interaction with him personally, at a personal level, was uh, around 1993 or 94 or thereabout. And I, I, I went to his offices and there he was with his bishops, um, the, the purple dress that he used to wear. And he, I, I went there with a Swedish colleague, uh, Alan Gustafsson, and there he was insisting on serving us, making us tea, picking up our cups, and 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 undertaking to clean them afterwards. And for me, as although I was a feminist but raised as an African woman, I, I just struggled with the whole idea of me being the one served tea as opposed to serving tea. The instinct was to stand up and, and do the serving of the tea. But that was his whole approach, was the the greatest among us is the one who serves, which is a quintessential reflection or ambassadorship of the values that Christ taught on this earth. And then the, the second time was when I delivered the first peace lecture at UWC and, and, and there was a bunch of young people that decided to disrupt it. They call themselves Len First, Black First. And they were la later linked to 
blood pool ginger. But at that stage, we really didn't know mm. what was going on. And when they, after that, he, he jokingly said to me, he, 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 he understands that I have forgiven them already because I know that they know not what they were doing, which is, of course, it's again a biblical text, but um, issued in a humorous way. And, and that was his quintessential style, humor, but serious at the same time. I would say he wanted us to forgive, but he was very clear that forgiveness does not mean you forget justice. It just means you approach justice from a position of repairing the damage or the injury, mm -hmm. but you don't approach justice from a position of revenge or vindictiveness. Yeah, you know, Prof, you've, you've raised, a, raised an interesting point about tradition and uh, I wonder if we use it against the backdrop of patriarchal culture and, and perhaps just uh, the religious backgrounds, you know, that uh, seem to influence society at large or particularly in South Africa. I mean, when we look, to, to condense uh, his life into a few minutes is probably such an injustice. But as we as we reflect on, on his passion for equality and equity at large, where do you think that um, that sense of, of, of justice and, and then that passion for equality came from over the years? Well, uh, he said so himself when I had an opp opportunity to talk to him, particularly that very first encounter. Mm. It came from himself experiencing being treated as less than. It came from witnessing his father being treated by a white, um, a, 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 as a subordinate to a young white woman. And it came from him as a teacher uh, suddenly being required to teach Bantu education. And it came from just many years of doing the right thing, being educated, working hard like everyone else, and yet being told that your place in society is diminished purely because of race. And he therefore had deep empathy that nobody should ever suffer a situation whereby their humanity is diminished purely because of the way life or God packaged them. And whether it's because they're gay, whether they're female, foreigner, disabled, etc. His view was Ubuntu dictates that I treat you the way I would like to be treated. When we think about Ubuntu, we only think about the fact that it is about our interconnectedness as humanity. But there's another deeper meaning to Ubuntu, is that I am as you are too. There's, my humanity is not greater than yours, and your humanity is not greater than mine, in addition to the fact that our humanity is inter connected and interdependent. Mm. Prof, perhaps in conclusion, I mean, you've spoken about uh, what his legacy entailed. And as we look you know, forward into this next chapter without him, um, perhaps leading in, in a different form, um, we've obviously seen the sociodynamics in South Africa. Same-sex uh, relationships are legal, but when we look at the discrimination and um, and, and the violence associated uh, or against the LGBTQI community at large, it, it seems to, to still continue, um, perhaps even unabated sometimes. I wonder how do we encompass what he stood for? How do we move on uh, as we charter this, uh, this next chapter of South Africa? Well, that's a great question. We always say that when a great one among us, such as Bishop Tutu has passed, our repayment of our debt of gratitude will be to take the baton and move the needle forward. But then we don't do it. I think what we need to do is honestly pull together a council of people and, and at Stellenbosch University will be prepared to work with people under the social justice and plan. Mm -hmm. A permanent um, commission, people's commission, that is looking at in what way do we remain unhealed because the constitution talks about healing the divisions of the past and establishing a new society and archbishop desmond tutu remained steadfast in playing his part until his last breath to build this new society that is founded on uh, democratic values social justice and fundamental human rights 
So let's just seize this moment and do this, but day after day, year after year. But also, let's just teach people what is Ubuntu mean, everyday Ubuntu. One of his granddaughters has written a book on Ubuntu. Maybe the starting point would be to, to make sure that every young person either gets the book or a summary of that book so that we can live this everyday Ubuntu on an everyday basis. Professor Tulimo Dunsela, thank you for your time. Thank you for those uh, heartfelt sentiments as well, obviously, as we reflect on the life and times of the late Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu. Again, that was former public protector and current chair in social justice research at the University of Stellenbosch, Professor Tulimo Dunsela, again, echoing and rehashing the legacy of the late Archbishop at this time. Well, let's take a listen to some of the sentiments expressed by Professor Tulimo Dunsela earlier this year during the 11th Desmond Tutu Peace uh, Lecture. Archbishop Desmond Tutu to answer to the call to discharge the burden of privilege by speaking out for justice and freedom for all. Despite the perils of speaking truth to power, he chose to ignite and engage in uncomfortable conversations. Even after formal apartheid fell and to the chagrin of his contemporaries that were now in government, he relentlessly lent his voice to just causes. Some of the uncomfortable truths that he dealt with are those relating to corruption and consumptive excesses of the elites in the face of persistent hunger and inequality. One of his famous pronouncements that did not go well with some of his peers was, I quote, if I go to heaven, and find the homophobic God, I will tell him I prefer the other place." Close quotes. This was a quintessential demonstration of his notion of justice as justice for all and not just us. As we celebrate this giant crusader for truth, justice and peace, we need to appreciate that inequality and poverty are not only enduring in some parts of the world, including our corner, the problem is worsening and posing a major threat to peace. It is, as Letambolo says in her song, not yet on Uhuru, for some and because of our interconnectedness for all of us. This is because as long as there is injustice somewhere, there cannot be sustainable peace anywhere. Archbishop Desmond Tutu has always known that injustice and peace cannot coexist, that poverty is an injustice, and so is unequal treatment of others in a manner that diminishes their humanity just because they're different in terms of color, religion, gender, and other human attributes. He also understood and still understands the uncomfortable truth that human rights promises in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and national constitutions are promises no less than any other. Love is universal. You don't have to tell someone love is better than hating. You don't have to believe in God to know that stealing is bad. All of God's children and their different faiths help to realize the immensity of God. No faith contains the whole truth about God, and certainly Christians don't have a corner on God. All of us belong to God. I can't for the life of me imagine that God would say, I will punish you because you are black, you should have been white. I will punish you because you are a woman, you should have been a man. I will punish you because you are a homosexual, you ought to have been heterosexual. I can't. I can't for the life of me believe that this is how God sees things.